despite the many successes of transition and transformation in Asia, when we look at debates in contemporary sub-Saharan Africa, there is enormous gloom about the prospects for transformation and transition. And that gloom comes partly out of the interpretation of economic theory. And there are three components to that. One is there is long-standing writing in the economic literature that says that agriculture has limited potential for productivity gains, doesn't generate productive linkages within the economy in the way that other sectors do, and is subject to low and falling prices. In a word, the prospects of agriculture are grim, and you only have to go through the canon of economic literature, through the greats of the 19th century, and there is tremendous pessimism about the options for, for, for agriculture. More recently, thinking in economics, there is a line which says that innovation comes through manufacturing. That is where you learn to become more capable, more competent, yeah? You don't get it from agriculture. It's an extraordinarily powerful message in the writing of people like Danny Roderick, and it seems to totally ignore the little-known fact that the growth of labor productivity in agriculture has been stronger across the world over the last 20-odd years than it has been in manufacturing. Lastly, on our theoretical gloom, agglomeration economies are wonderful, urban economies are tremendous. That has put a gloss onto the urban economy that tends to throw agriculture into the shadow. I also want to look at the social differences and what they may mean through development, transformation, and transitions. One of the interpretations of this diagram says this. If you leave things to the most basic of government policies and all the rest goes to the market, the only ones who are going to step up, intensify, and commercialize successfully are going to be 3% plus 9% equals 12% equals 88% either in poverty or looking for something else to do. That could mean mass movement to the cities, 12 versus 88. If we bring in the 20% with a more inclusive smallholder growth, we can go to roughly one-third, two-third, and we can expect the kinds of multipliers that we see in rural societies to generate an awful lot of additional jobs for more decent livelihoods for the other two-thirds, and we will expect, of course, a certain amount of migration to towns and cities. It's more feasible to see how this could be a decent transition with uh, inclusive outcomes if we can bring in those 20% of smallholders. Whether we can do this, whether we can sort out rural market failures is absolutely critical for the future of rural Africa. Are we going to have the inclusive growth that I think all of us want, or is it going to be a stilted growth that will leave many people in misery while a few gain? For those benign transitions that we want, we have to have factor markets that work in decent ways and also efficient ways. So we need to have institutions that give us land transfers which are both efficient, so people who've got the means to farm the land get to them, and this does not mean large farms, by the way, it just means certain people and the smallholders, while decently rewarding those people who have that land as their heritage. And we need institutions that will allow us to transfer capital. And intriguingly, a lot of the agricultural development of Asia has taken place while capital has moved. It's moved from illiquid sources, first of all, cash under the mattress, old livestock jewelry, into more liquid and productive forms of capital, but it's also moved quite strongly into urban areas once it's been in a liquid form. It's very simple what happened in Southeast Asia. A sound macroeconomy, economic freedom for peasants and small entrepreneurs, pro-poor, pro-rural public spending. And this isn't just spending on agriculture, it's the whole of the rural dimension. It needs to be inclusive, not spending on a few favoured large commercial farmers, but making it an inclusive spending. They're the rural investment climate and the rural public goods. There's no need historically in Southeast Asia for industrial policy. 
And now my very final point, patience. Transformation and transitions take time. In the case of Europe, we're dealing with 150 years or more to make those transitions. Asia has done brilliantly, and it's made those transitions, but I don't know of a case in Asia where it's taken less than 30 years. In debates on Africa, we are constantly setting targets for the next five years. 